In the final series of mechanical properties of materials, I have uh, chosen three very important properties. One is the hardness, where I will explain that uh, how we do the qualitative testing as well as the quantitative testing of hardness and what is the relationship between hardness and strength, uh, which is very important in the design of a system. And then secondly, I will talk about creep and finally, I will talk about damping. So, these are the three important mechanical properties, which we will cover in this final series. So, first let us talk about the hardness. Now, hardness by definition, it is a measure of a material's resilience to localized plastic deformation. Okay. So, for example, a small indentation or a scratch. So, uh, let me repeat. So, it is a measure of materials resistance to localized plastic deformation. Example, a small indentation or a scratch. Now, uh, there are various advantages of hardness testing. First of all, it is a very simple and inexpensive test. You do not need a very special uh, sample preparation. Of course, for micro hardness you will need, which we will talk about it uh, subsequently. But for simple hardness testing, no special specimen preparation is needed and the apparatus is also relatively cheaper. So, one can carry out the hardness testing, uh, you know, in a relatively less expensive way. Secondly, it is considered to be a non-destructive method, because uh, you are really making a very small indentation without really affecting uh, the overall sample. And finally, uh, from the hardness test, you will not only get the hardness, but also you can get some important informations like say the tensile strength. Okay. So, this is a very important thing okay, that can be obtained from the hardness data. For example, for metals there is something called a Tabor relationship, okay, in which if you know one of the hardness data in the Brinell scale, uh, the H B data and then you should be able to actually uh, use that data uh, and then you can find out the ultimate tensile strength S u using this relationship, where x is n minus 2 and n varies between. 2 to 2.7 and this is also known as the Mayer index. So, such you know this is just an example that how you can further exploit the hardness data and uh, find out uh, you know certain important properties. Now, hardness uh, generally are in the in initial stage was used to be actually uh, found out through a very qualitative method, which we used to be mostly used by the geologists and uh, that is based on the ability of one material to scratch another. Okay. So, in that scale the geologist used to consider talc to be the softest material and it is uh, absolute hardness keeping it as one, then they you know various materials are used to actually scratch on talc and that uh, from the depth of uh, indentations and the power of scratching and then the scratching of one over the other, the ranking used to be done. So, from that scale, if you see that from a very low hardness to a high hardness, you are getting uh, you know something like diamond as the highest hardness 1600. So, that was a kind of a, of course, a very qualitative way of uh, you know determining the hardness. It can only give you an idea of relative hardness one with respect to the other that suppose there are you are taking two materials and you are able to scratch material B with the help of material A and that would signify that the hardness of material A is more than the hardness of material B. So, that was a very qualitative method in the Mohs scale. At a later stage, you know the quantitative hardness tests uh, started to get even evolved and then uh, there are basically two classifications of them. One is called the macro hardness test, uh, where as I told you that not much of sample preparation is needed and the other group is called the micro hardness test. Now, in the macro hardness test, uh, there are many, but we have chosen 
Rockwell hardness test, Brinell hardness test and Vickers hardness test and in the micro hardness test, the NUP micro hardness test and Vickers micro hardness test. So, total you know these are the 5 experiments that actually one can carry out in order to find out quantitatively the value of hardness. So, uh, the first one is the Rockwell hardness test. Now, a, the basic principle as I told you that resistance to plastic deformation that is same in all the cases. So, the only thing is that what kind of a indenter the you are using in terms of you know like this indenter if you look at it the geometry of the indenter that actually varies from test to test. So, when we talk about a Rockwell hardness test first of all Rockwell hardness test employs two uh, different loads one is a minor load uh, ok it is first applied uh, for good contact between the indenter and the sample surface and this followed by a major load and the depth of indentation is recorded on a dial gauge after removing the major load. Now, here the indenter is actually cone shaped indenter which is usually used for harder materials and sometimes for steel ball uh, for relatively less hard materials. And so, the sequence if you look at it that you first apply the minor load and then you apply the minor plus the major load and then you withdraw the major load. So, you have the minor load and then withdraw all of them and then measure the depth of penetration. Now, suppose you know what is the permanent increase in the depth of penetration due to major load. Okay. So, once you know that and then uh, you know there is a constant E which depends on the form of indenter. Okay. So, for example, uh, if you use diamond indenter, you, you, you this is about 100, if you use steel wall indenter is about 130. So, then you can get H r Rockwell hardness number by actually simply subtracting this uh, small e from capital E. So, that is how you can get it. Now, in the HRA scale, you know there are three scales of Rockwell scale. One is scale A, which is known as HRA, and there the indenter is cone shaped indenter. The load is usually 60 kg, it is used for carbides and ceramics. So, that means it is used mostly for ceramics type of systems. Then the B scale of Rockwell HRB, where we use the steel in ball indenter the load is more here about 100 kg to create plastic deformation and then uh, the typical material is, is used in the non ferrous metals it is used. And then C, C is used mostly for steel. So, H R C scale and then once again you use a cone shape 150 kg load is used for ferrous metals and tool steels. So, that is the Rockwell hardness test. Okay. And this is a typical Rockwell hardness machine that you can see here as a Rockwell hardness machine. Now, uh, the other one that is uh, also very popular is called the Brinell hardness test and this is used for also testing metals and non metals of low to medium hardness. Okay. So, Rockwell hardness uh, you include the ceramics also whereas, in this case it is mostly for metals and non metals of low to medium hardness. Now, uh, in this case however, the indentation is done not by a cone, but by a hardened steel ball as you can see it here that by a hardened steel ball okay, uh, or sometimes it is cemented carbide ball of 10 millimeter diameter is generally capital D that is what is generally conventionally used which is pressed into the surface of specimen using a load P of uh, either this load varies either 500 kg or 1500 or 3000 kg for a specified time and the time is generally between 10 to 30 seconds minimum 10 seconds up to 30 seconds. Now, you know which load you are using you know what is the diameter you are using and then all you have to do is that you have to find out this mean indentation diameter. That means, you know you get the indented shape and you calculate this diameter at two different points D 1 and D 2 and then take an average of it. So, that is what is our D and once you know D you can use uh, you know this formulation to find out the H B. 
and there is a thumb rule here and that is the tensile strength can be actually calculated directly as 3.45 times H V and uh, that is usually used for steel alloys. But as I told you earlier itself couple of slides before if you remember that generally uh, a more generalized relationship is actually this one which is used in terms of finding out the uh, what you call uh, the strength uh, for various types of materials. So, this is not very material specific. Okay. Now, uh, we come to the Vickers uh, hardness test. Okay. Here, what is the difference? Unlike these uh, Brunel hardness test, the shape is different here as you can see that it is a square base uh, diamond pyramid indenter and which is generally having an angle of 136 degree uh, is between the opposite faces that is what is used in the Vickers hardness test. Okay. And in this case the hardness is obtained by dividing the load which is generally 1 to 120 kg with the surface area of the indentation. And the surface area is calculated from the diagonals uh, you know of the length of the impression. So, here the impression is actually uh, you know uh, something like uh, in this case it is a square type of an indentation unlike the circular indentation that you have seen for the Brunel case. So, you uh, once you know this indentation size okay, then uh, you know that and you know the force that you are applying. So, 1.854 times that and F is the applied load in kg and uh, then you will be able to get the Vickers hardness test. So, that is how these three tests are used in terms of finding out the quantified value of the hardness data. Now, uh, sometimes what happens is that uh, this uh, hardness uh, is insufficient particularly when you will see that uh, you know you make a very very thin layer. Okay. So, this uh, kind of general hardness is good for uh, when you have a single material but many a times uh, what happens is that we give a special surface coating on metals. Okay. Let us say you know we talk, you know, when we actually work on things like suppose gears. Okay. So, you know uh, these are the suppose the faces of the gears and which works against another gear. Okay. So, a smaller gear. Now, so there is a continuous contact between the two. So, in this kind of surfaces you know you must give a special coating okay, on the cutting to uh, on the teeth of the gear. So, you give a special very thin you know uh, coating layer which is very hard. So, that you know to save it from wear and tear. Now, this kind of very thin coating layers uh, you cannot really you know see that how uh, you, you cannot really use you know uh, the macro hardness tests for doing that you need a micro hardness test for doing it. So, for such cases you know the micro hardness test comes into picture and the important thing here that the load applied here is much smaller because the indentation thickness is very low. Okay. Indentation itself is very small and sample preparation is definitely needed. Okay. So, there are two methods that is used loop hardness and Vickers micro hardness. Uh, Let us go to each one of them. So, in the Vickers uh, micro hardness test it I mean the loop hardness test uh, it is mostly used for very brittle materials or thin sheets. Okay. So, here you use uh, a pyramidical uh, pyramidal diamond point okay, which is pressed into the polished surface of the test material for a specified dual time and uh, the resulting indentation is measured now using a microscope. Okay. So, the length to width ratio of the pyramid is maintained as 7 is to 1 okay. and then you can actually find out the new hardness value where f is the load in kg and l is the long diagonal of the impression. So, you can use this relationship in order to get the new hardness value. So, that is as you can see here that uh, the load here. Uh, that is used f is the load in kg. Now, that load is substantially smaller in comparison to the uh, you know macro hardness tests. The other uh, one is actually Vickers micro hardness test. Here also you can see that the 
load range is like 100 grams, okay, 1 to 100 grams. So, uh, that is the kind of a thing we are talking about when we talk about micro hardness tests. Now, this uh, uh, you know uh, slide gives us a kind of a very broad picture of two things. One is that suppose I work with uh, something like a Brinell hardness, okay, then I can actually compare that what will be the performance of the same material in terms of Rockwell hardness or I can compare it in terms of NUF hardness etcetera or even with the Mohs hardness. And the other thing is also this tell is telling us is that what is the general range of hardness that we can expect, because the material science has advanced so much that most of them are fairly standardized now. So, for example, when you talk about the nitride uh, you know steels, so somewhere you know between 1000 to 2000 maybe 1200 or 1300 is the maximum value you can see and uh, in the uh, Brunel hardness scale. For the cutting tool, it is somewhere like as you can see maximum value of 700 around that range. Okay. And uh, similarly, you know uh, for all other materials like for brasses as you can see that it is uh, somewhere like 70 or so in the renal hardness. So, you this uh, you know particular slide tells us that where do we expect the values to come from that has been standardized. The other thing also that the formulation that I told you. Uh, which is uh, used for the calculation of the yield strength. In this table, which is uh, from the uh, in Ashby and Jones book, uh, you know you can actually get this directly this yield strength. For example, you get some value like 1200 and you go through this, you get an yield strength of something like 4000 MPa. So, corresponding to each such values in the hardness testing machine, you can get an approximate yield strength value. So, that is the good part of this kind of a handy table. Okay. So, we have talked about the hardness. Next, let us come to another important property that is what is called the creep. Okay. Now, uh, many of you uh, you know uh, might have experienced creep as a day to day experience. For example, uh, you know you use the nylon wear uh, for outdoor garments uh, drying. right? And you will see that uh, you put a fixed tension, you fix your nylon wires uh, and then uh, you know you put your garments uh, day one and after a month or so you see that this whole thing is actually slacking, slacking and you know it is coming down more and more, it is getting loose. So, why is this happening? This happens because under a continuous load every material starts to get a permanent deformation over a period of time, which is known as creep. Now, creep has a very high temperature dependency. Uh, naturally, if the temperature is more, then what will happen is that there will be as you are going closer to the melting point, you know you are getting a flow like behavior. So, under loading this effect of these uh, deformed permanent deformation will be much more. And uh, a creep test generally involves a tensile specimen. Once again, in uh, you know you can use a universal testing machine under a constant load maintained and a, under a constant temperature. So that temperature is important because as the temperature increases, the same stress level can actually create much more deformation in the system. Now, this is a very very important test because its application is there in terms of suppose turbine blades which work at a very high temperature level or nuclear reactor components, jet engines, heat exchangers. So, those applications where there is a stress or mechanical loading at elevated temperature creep is must. Okay. So, that is what you know uh, is the importance of the creep test. Now, uh, creep generally occurs in three stages. Okay. So, the first one is the primary stage, which is for a smaller duration, mostly times the end. And then there is a longer period, which is known as a secondary stage. And the creep rate is uh, more or less steady in such a case. Okay. So, you can get a slope, a continuous slope more or less at this stage. Uh, okay. And you can predict that how much it will be creeping in that time period. Then there is a tertiary stage. Okay. So, that is you know as you can see here, 
that with respect to time beyond a particular time, the creep increases actually exponentially as you can see in this picture. So, that is you know uh, that actually goes towards the failure. Now, at a temperature I told you that uh, less than 0.4 of the melting point temperature, uh, generally after the initial deformation, the strain is virtually independent of time. But with the increase in stress or temperature, the creep strain increases and the rupture life increases rapidly. Now, to do all these things, we use uh, mnemonic 75 this is EU actually European Union standard as the creep reference material. So, any new material you want to test, you test it with respect to mnemonics. These mnemonics are basically nickel based super alloys okay, and uh, they contain about 50 percent of nickel and 20 percent on chromium with some additives such as titanium and aluminum. So, with respect to this reference, you can actually measure that what is the creep that is happening to the system. Now, here you can see that when the temperature is less than 0.4 T m, the creep is not so predominant, okay. the creep strain is almost constant, but uh, you know uh, if the temperature increases okay, or stress increases, you can see how the nature is changing. Okay. That means, there is a steady increase of the creep strain. So, that is uh, something that is you know that needs to be always studied with respect to a material. And uh, there is a, I will not go into the details at this moment, but there are various mechanical models that are used actually. A very common model is something like you know a spring, okay, a material model and a dash pot combination in series. Okay. So, uh, and the load is coming here. Okay. So, uh, this is a spring K and this is a dash pot. Okay. So, imagine that you are applying a load f and how this system will be behaving. Okay. So, that is something that approximately you know kind of uh, simulates the creep behavior of a system. Okay. Finally, I will talk about damping, okay, which is very important because uh, as you know that many mechanical systems undergoes dynamic loading okay, and also civil uh, you know structures like which uh, you know uh, undergoes dynamic loading because of different reasons like uh, wind loading or earthquake or maybe uh, you know mo uh, vehicles moving transport load etcetera. So, vibration is ubiquitous. Now, uh, there must be a material property which actually uh, determines that what is the level of vibration uh, you know or uh, what is the kind of energy dissipation possible in the system. Now, uh, this uh, method of uh, vibration reduction actually uh, you know there are two ways one is the damping capacity and another is to the stiffness. Damping specifically refers to the dissipation of energy from a vibrating system. So, it is mostly the damping that is important particularly during the resonance of a system uh, that means, when the natural frequency matches with the excitation frequency, it is the damping which creates the predominant row. So, uh, the damping study is very important and uh, that helps in terms of shock absorption, fatigue failure prevention, noise reduction etcetera. So, this is typically an under damped curve as you can see and this is actually under viscous damping and you can see that the response is coming down exponentially. Okay. So, as the damping increases, this actually will be more and more and there is something we call the settling time. That means, in comparison to the initial value plus minus about uh, you know 2 to 5 percent when the amplitude you know the initial amplitude comes down to within say 2 to 5 percent level, we say that the vibration has actually damped down. So, uh, you know there are various ways in which we can actually quantify the damping. Now, there are two important types of damping, one is called the viscous damping and as you can see that uh, like a seismic protection or in, any, in, in any door you will see that the door closer is actually a dash pot. Okay. So, this dash pot uh, you know is uh, having actually a piston and a cylinder combination and the damping force here is considered to be proportional to the velocity across the damper and acting in the direction opposite to that of the velocity. So, if the direction of force is this way okay, 
and then the opposing force damping is coming as an opposing force. Okay, it is opposing the direction of the velocity. Okay, and uh, so this is very important uh, in terms of viscous damping model. Uh, there is another uh, type of a damping model also that is known as the Coulomb damping model. So, which is basically dry friction force between two solid interfaces. Now, in this model, uh, the magnitude of damping force, unlike the last case where it is proportional to velocity, which means higher the velocity, more is the resistance. In this case, the damping force is assumed to be constant, and that is, it is independent of the relative velocity, unlike the last case. However, uh, what happens is that there is a signum function that governs. Okay, so uh, the signum function is positive for positive velocity and negative for negative velocity. Okay. So, that is how the damping force will change its direction, change its sign. So, that is for the Coulomb damping. So, these are the two very important dampings, viscous damping and Coulomb damping. Now, how material properties are related to it? Okay. So, one important thing here is that what is the damping ratio and damping ratio is basically the ratio of damping constant to the critical damping of a system. Suppose, we consider a single uh, degree of freedom system, something like you know like if we can draw it a single degree of freedom system, something like a stiff say a spring here, a damper or a dash pot here and a mass m. Okay. So, this is called a single degree of freedom system, it can actually move only in one direction. Okay. So, in such a case, the damping ratio zeta is actually the ratio of C over C C, where C C is the critical damping called 2 root K. And thus, uh, for critically damped system, the value of zeta is actually unity, because C equals to C C, whereas for under damped systems, zeta is much, much less than unity. Like as you can see here, that this is the case of a critically damped system and all these where the oscillations are actually continuing are the cases, these are the cases of under damped system. So, this is under damped, okay, under damped system and uh, this is the one single case that is shown where zeta value is greater than unity, this is the over damped case, which is not generally you know. Uh, you would not see that, that practically, most of the cases it is actually under damped case and uh, it, it is of importance that what will be the value of the zeta at uh, that corresponding to that under damped case. In fact, the quality factor q also you know actually determines the degree of under damping and uh, which is typically the ratio of the bandwidth to the central frequency of the system. In the next slide, I will just show you that how the damping changes the response of a system. So, if you just uh, you know uh, look at this that there are two systems I have shown here. Uh, one is this is a system which is like a, uh, uh, a system which has a damper. It is like a damper which is in the form of a copper um, you know block here uh, which actually uh, converts uh, you know the oscillatory motion. Uh, inside the copper block, there are actually magnetic uh, blocks there and the magnetic blocks uh, gets uh, actually uh, you know uh, as it moves inside the copper block, it actually generates the eddy current and thus the vibration is converted to electrical energy in the copper block. So, that is uh, uh, you know a kind of a damper okay. and then there is uh, this situation where there is no damper because there is you can see there is no copper block there and uh, hence even if there are these magnets here as you can see, this magnets actually has to create a electric field in order to create damping. Now, let us see that how such a system would actually behave uh, you know in terms of uh, is if you can see in terms of the oscillations. Look at the right hand side and see that how vigorous is the oscillation if you look at the top plate okay and you can also see it in the oscilloscope and if you look at the left hand side you would see that most of the vibrating energy is getting transferred to electrical energy and hence you know you get much less uh, vibration amplitude in the left hand side case so that is uh, typically you know 
uh, what you will see in case in the case of a uh, uh, you know say system which has a damper in it. In this case the specific damper is called a eddy current damper and the frequency is uh, of damping is around 8 hertz. Okay. So, it is between 7 to 8 hertz level you would see it. As you increase the frequency you may come across a situation where this will be even more vigorous here. Okay. Uh, and uh, on the other hand you will see that with the damper there will be hardly any uh, you know as I told you that the damping is very important close to the resonance. So, hence you know whenever you will come across the resonance you will see that the damping becomes you see you know there is a sudden decrease in the whole system. So, that is uh, you know uh, kind of an example that how with and without damping a typically a system would behave. Okay. Now, uh, let us go back to the quantification of the damping. So, while quantifying the damping, uh, we uh, have to talk about another very important factor which is known as the loss factor. Okay. And the loss factor is actually uh, uh, defined uh, in terms of the ratio of the energy dissipated from the system to the energy stored in the system for every oscillation. So, that means, uh, you know uh, if you consider that there is a under damped situation that means, so with respect to time if you plot the response uh, then the response is in a cyclic manner. Then at uh, however, the amplitude is coming down gradually. So, uh, you find out that for one particular cycle. Okay. So, let us say from this point to this point. Okay, uh, you have to find out what is the uh, ratio of the energy dissipated from the system and what is the energy stored in the system. So, that gives you the loss factor eta and that is a material property and this eta is actually related to both the quality factor and the zeta by this particular relationship. Okay. So, even though zeta and uh, form factor q are not directly the material property, but eta is a material property, because the more the you know there is hysteresis for example, in the material the more will be this kind of energy dissipation. And this actually uh, you know some material for example, aluminum you will see that the loss factor is much smaller in comparison to steel. So, which means steel dissipates more energy inside it. And if you look at rubbers which are generally used as damping materials, they have a much much higher right like an order of magnitude higher of uh, the loss factor. So, that says that why you know we use rubber or neoprene etcetera as damping material unlike the metals. Generally polymers uh, have much larger energy dissipation and hence the eta is much more for the polymers. So, that is uh, broadly you know uh, the uh, mechanical properties that we have discussed. In the next lecture, we will now leave the mechanical properties. We will try to find out what is the source, what is the reason of these mechanical properties and uh, we will start that uh, with the atomic bonding. Okay. So, we will go to the very core issue of atomic bonding and uh, we will see things like the ionic bond, covalent bond, metallic bond, hydrogen bond and van der Waal bonds. So, that once we understand some of these properties we will be able to explain with the help of the atomic body. Thank you.